Okay, YouTubers, we have a very exciting video today. I think it's been a long time coming, this video. The whole, what is the rockabilly guitar tone? What is the authentic rockabilly guitar tone? What are the right underpants to be wearing when you're playing rockabilly? Just kidding. We've all, we've all gone, we're not going to go down that road today. We're not going to bash the authentic rockabilly scene either. I love that stuff myself. Uh, and I'm wearing authentic rockabilly underpants. But uh, what we are going to do today is actually have a good look at what sort of defines the rockabilly tone. We're going to go through the eras a little bit. That might be, that's a weird word in the Australian accent, eras, eras. That, and that sounds like a mistake, uh, which I'm probably going to make plenty of those as well. But we're going to look at the different periods of the rockabilly sounds and try and demystify some of the smoke around this subject. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the 50s. We're going to talk about rockabilly in the 50s. There were definitely things happening before and a lot of cool stuff happening before with the electric guitar. But I want to talk about the 50s. And what I really want to focus on are the guitar sounds that were popular, that were huge. You know, um, I'm thinking Sun Records, basically, where we saw that explosion of rockabilly uh, on the charts. And just remember that rock and roll and rockabilly, they're pretty similar. So we're going to blur those things together a little bit. Um, but I think it's that country element that you heard a little bit more in those early recordings uh, that really influenced the, the certainly the playing, uh, which I'll get into. I'm also going to talk about the playing and, and the way the playing sounded. Um, but the first thing that I want to mention is on those early recordings, just remember they didn't have delay pedals or slapback pedals. So all of those early Sun Records recordings that sort of exploded, you know, and, and made Rockabilly a household thing, they didn't have echoes or anything like that. You listen to That's Alright Mama. We can take any slapback off. Okay. So right now I'm just running through the Supro. I've got the Nocturne Mystery Brain there. I love that pedal. That's not a product placement at all. I bought that. Um, and I've actually just got the uh, JHS Angry Driver using the Blues Driver element of it. Okay. So I'm just using the Blues Driver to give a bit of a cranked amp sort of simulation a very light drive that I believe was happening in those studios back then because they were probably getting these small amps and turning up, turning them up really loud. So if you li listen to that sort of tone, if I wanted to get that sound, I'd be probably going on the middle selection. And you can hear particularly on those last drums, that little bit of break up there, uh, you know, that you can hear on the recordings, that's actually not a bad little setup for that original sound. Now, obviously, you're hearing the room, and that was definitely a feature of Sun Records, but if we're talking about the actual guitar tone, it was just a guitar plugged straight into an amp, and we know that it was probably an ES-295 or something like that, uh, from what Scotty Moore was certainly appearing on stage with at the time. But, uh, yeah, I definitely believe, uh, at the very least, it was an arch top of some sort straight into an amp, but it almost doesn't really matter too much. So the other thing that I want to talk about is a lot of the guys would have been using just whatever they could get their hands on. I mean, even Luther Perkins, uh, it, you know, if we're going back into the Sun Records sound, uh, he was using a, a Telecaster, and it's probably all he could afford. In fact, he, he probably had to save up to buy that, you know, and that was all those early recordings with the Telecaster again. Uh for the early part of the 50s, it would have just been straight into an amp. There were no pedals, there were no effects. So there's sort of a, a touch of irony there that a true rockabilly tone is almost straight into an amp, at least if you look at those earlier periods. But we're also going to look at the mid-50s, the late 50s, and obviously there's things beyond that that we're going to talk about. So, uh, and just quickly too, you know, if you think about... literally straight in uh, again I've got that just that little bit of drive from the pedal because I don't want to crank the amp till it starts to sing uh, but that that to me that's the sound that's that early authentic sound if we want to go in that direction 
But there's more to come. It's not as simple as me just saying, that's the authentic rockabilly tone. Throw your delay pedals in the bin and burn your Brian Setzer albums, okay? Because there's more to this story. Don't ever do either of those things. They're both wonderful things. So now um, I want to move along to sort of the mid-50s when we did start to hear echo and all kinds of sounds. But before I do that, there's one other thing that's worth mentioning because even in the late uh, sort of mid-50s, we didn't really see, well, we certainly didn't see humbuckers. So that early rockabilly sound on all those recordings, single coil is a big part of that, whether it's a P90 or a Telecaster like this or a harmony guitar, like the gold foils or something, single coils were a huge part of that early rockabilly sound. So that gets into some interesting territory when people often talk about Gretsch as being the rockabilly guitar and the Filtertrons being the rockabilly pickups. So, but I'm going to address that later, so don't punch your computer screen or throw your phone in the bin and let me make you upset to um, think that I'm diminishing that. I'm not at all. Diminished chords are great, by the way. So, uh, in the mid-50s, that's when we did start to hear echoes and stuff like that. And leading up to that, I know that in the studios, from what I've read and what I've heard, they cert- certainly started to muck around. I mean, even in Sun Records, for example, they had you know tiled walls and things that were deliberately creating a little bit of room effect. And, and I guess you could argue that there would be some elements of slapback going on in, in a fine way. But again, coming back to the guitar tone, w- the guitar would have just been plugged straight in. So we've established that. But in the 50s they were becoming a bit more deliberate, you know, in the mid-50s, they were becoming a bit more deliberate and doing really clever things and using machines and and stuff to start getting a delay tone. Um, What I also want to mention is it's it's the mid-50s where Gretsch's did become a bit more prevalent. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to grab my duo jet. I haven't played this guitar for a long time. Let's just, let's just spend a moment. Mm, she's not very happy with me either. Well, I'm, I did play some weird stuff there, but... tally i do miss that a little bit at times i've really been enjoying the tally but it's always feels a little bit like coming home playing a gretch so it was the mid 50s that we saw uh gene vincent with clip gal cliff <laughs> clip gallop clip gallop cliff gallop uh you know wielding that duo jet and that sound very recognizable you know a, a little more i'd say just a, a little more punchy than the telecaster uh and you know you hear that obviously on the What is that? Uh, Race with the Devil. Uh, Yeah, my brain's sort of left me behind today. But so, you know, those tones, I know you guys don't need me to play it anyway. The legends have already done it. So those sounds started to happen. And then we also started to hear Eddie Cochran uh, doing... I've forgotten how to play it. There it goes. That unmistakable Gretsch twang, but it was the single coils. We are talking Diamonds there, fat single coils. And I think that was a really big feature of Rockabilly in the 50s, particularly through the mid 50s. You know, we had um, Les Paul, there was the Gibson Les Paul that had the P90s in it from around 52, uh, maybe slightly earlier, but that's when it was sort of starting to show up. And then you saw guys like Carl Perkins wielding at 53, 54, 55, 56, probably sort of more towards the mid 50s. Uh, and of course, Scotty Moore using the uh, P90 clad Gibson 295, and so he, I think he used one of the fancy ones as well later on. Um, but all through that early to mid 50s, P90s, uh, and then the the Gretches came into prevalence a little bit in the in the mid 50s. I feel uh, because yeah, I mean they were the two main guys, and then by sort of the late 50s, and don't forget around 56. Chet Atkins was, you know, being endorsed by Gretsch. It might have been earlier. I'm not sure. Someone can probably let me know in the comments there. But all the guitar players of that period were heavily influenced by someone like Chet Atkins. They all looked up to him. uh, And they all, you know, they all 
would be very interested to see what he was playing. So Eddie Cochran's a great example. He was a big Chet Atkins fan, um, but he also didn't really like the adornment of the Chet Atkins name on his guitar, so he kind of scratched that off. So we did start seeing Gretsch's being used, but prior to that sort of 55 period, I, you can't say that there was a lot of Gretsch's even being used. So it's, a, you know, again, when we talk about what's the rockabilly guitar and a lot of people saying, you know, you got to have a Gretsch, well, I don't. I, at this stage, I would tell you, at the very least, that's not entirely true. You can see there's a lot of options there, and it certainly doesn't have to be a Filtertron clad Gretsch. But again, I'm going to talk about that more shortly. So as we get sort of towards 57, 58, the technology is getting better, and you're starting to hear that. But it's probably I'm going to dial it down because if I'm thinking late 50s. Yeah, okay. So that's, you know, that a little bit of echo? Yes, I'm hearing that, but you, it's re this is really important in my opinion. You want an echo that's really preserving your dry signal. Why? Because those original recordings, again, still were played with a dry signal. Cliff Gullett would have plugged straight into an amp for those recordings, and that echo, okay, was added later. So these guys were still playing with a dry signal, which is actually crazy, because for me, uh, when I get that signal all nice and, um, you know, slapback sounding, uh, it, it really is inspiring, and you end up having a lot of fun just sort of rolling around the fretboard. Uh, and that would be harder to do now in my mind without that slapback sound. So moving towards the later 50s, again, you know, Dwayne Eddy, I feel like a name that should be mentioned, his sound for, um, you know, see if I remember how to play this. With a little bit of tremolo, if I remember rightly, and that really big reverb sound. So I think they had a, a, a tank outside, and they were running a pipe, and they put a microphone uh, in there, and the sound would travel through the pipe from the studio into there, which is so cool and so clever, um, and obviously an important part of that sound. So obviously you don't need a water tank. We've got all the effects now. But again, he was still playing with a dry tone. But yes, overall, we're starting to really hear in that sort of mid-50s to later 50s, we're hearing that echo become very prevalent. Okay, now, as we sort of close up into the late 50s, sadly, Rockabilly falls victim to, you know, the, the sort of the rock and roll revolution. And we see, you know, the, the British rock and all that kind of stuff through the 60s, and then, and then into the 70s, we get sort of more power rock and roll, and then 80s, forget about it. But, you know, there is something important to mention there, which I know a few of you are probably waiting for some really big stuff going on later on for Rockabilly. Um, but yeah, so there were, there were definitely things probably happening in the sixties that showed the influence of rockabilly, but it would be fair to say that, uh, rockabilly took a real backseat for a while. So this takes us to our next part and that is Brian Setzer. So early eighties comes out of nowhere well, seemingly out of nowhere. And this is where things begin to change, but Brian Setzer you know, uh, he he didn't play a Telecaster. You guys know he played a Gretsch. But not only that, he favoured the Filtertrons and he loved that tone. So I'm just going to grab my TV Jones clad Gretsch and we'll have a little bit of a play around. <laughs> Okay, so now we're getting into a different territory. You'll notice it's a brighter, more sort of full, more bell-like tone. Also, I would argue a little bit smoother, like when we, uh, the, the Filtertrons, the humbuckers always kind of smooth out the tone a little bit. Uh, and another thing that I think uh, was really noticeable was we, we started to hear a, a more, uh, a stronger tape mix. So I'm actually, I'll just, I should have done this first, but I'm just gonna put that tape mix up. 
We start to hear almost like a double tracked, you know, big fat slap back on those sort of licks. By the way, if you've come this far, I hope you don't mind me doing this now. Uh, but I've, I'm putting a course together called Rockabilly Rebuild, where I actually explain the elements of Rockabilly in terms of this, you know, if we know what a major scale is and we move that around and manipulate it, we can understand what makes it sound like Rockabilly and then moving that around the neck. So that's a course that's available on my website. There are four modules currently. The fifth one will complete the course. And then the course will actually be for sale individually if you don't want to sign up to the website. But anyhow, apologies for the little advertisement interruption. Let's talk about Brian sets his tone and what separates it from the other stuff. I've already covered a lot of it. Humbuckers, that slightly smoother tone. And I also think all the upper mids are lifted a little bit because we now had that interesting technology floating around like the Space Echo. And we know that Brian said to use that and the uh, preamp was a really big part of his tone. And Nocturne Mystery, the Nocturne Mystery Brain does all of that stuff. It's built to do all of that stuff. It's got the preamp built in, which I've now put on, which you, know, you may notice there's a there's a there's quite a clear, uh, lovely upper mid crunch and punch to the tone. Uh, and of course, the slapback, I've, I've brought up the mix a little bit. So that's something that wasn't so prevalent back in the 50s. Obviously, we didn't you know, have that technology, and so it's not something that you would hear in the guitar tone. Uh, it might come through in the recordings, depending on how they're captured, but you know, I think Brian Setzer had a sound in his mind that he's put together that, if I'm honest, is different to that original early rockabilly sound. So that's why you get a little bit of that... Uh, push and pull from different parties saying this is a you know the the Brian Sitz is not the original rockabilly sound well no he's not but it is an amazing sound it's i would consider it the modern rockabilly sound because it's it's paved the way for this particular modern rockabilly sound very influenced by that and now there's one other guitar player that has to be mentioned and that's Danny Gatton for that i'm going to need to go back to the telly <laughs> Danny Gatton was kind of all of those things that we talked about with Brian Setzer in terms of having that technology and having a particular sound. Uh, but he also, I think, uh, incorporated a lot of the, you know, a lot of Nashville and country picking techniques into his playing. So I want to touch briefly just to sort of round all this out that another huge element of authentic sound, it's actually the way people played. In the early 50s, you know, I feel like it was all a little bit stiffer. <laughs> Because those guys would have come off playing or grown up listening to swing music, you know, early old swing and stuff, um, or coming from country backgrounds that was, you know, the music was, I guess, a little stiffer. I don't, I don't want to use the word stiffer. I'm just not thinking of a better word right now. I love all that kind of stuff. But I think you understand what I'm trying to say. There was just a lot more emphasis on the downbeat, um, but with with music later on even even the um with the event of or the advent of uh even with cliff gallop for example things started to swing more the forgetting that that song is actually in e and hanging around on a too long but it the feel just changed you know the feel started to pick up and become a little bit more jumpy and it swung a little harder you know i noticed definitely when you listen to recordings by about 50 Five, fifty-six when uh, all that stuff, and of course, uh, Grady Martin's another great example. He's playing um, again. It sort of has that stiff sort of feeling. That, uh, hang on. No. Yeah, sort of a little bit stiff and stodgy, but then the licks. <laughs> bit more syncopation in there so things you know sort of really started to get interesting from the 50s so i've jumped back a little bit i apologize getting back to danny gatton and brian said so i think the thing that puts them to me in that modern department is the technology was more modern and we still kind of use similar things now those guys you know obviously probably had you know like the original roland space echo or the um you know t actual tape machines and all that at their disposal 
Um, but we're still using technology to create that tone and the overall character was, you know, that you had this incredible slap back. So back to Brian Setzer and Danny Gatton too, their playing evolved and so their sound kind of evolved as well. We we sort of saw, you know, that sort of stiff, you know, experimentation and, and more fundamental ideas in the early 50s. I think things started to flow a bit, a bit better mid 50s uh, and then obviously with the sort of death of rockabilly uh, or temporary sleep of rockabilly through the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, we had a whiz kid like Brian Setzer or we had whiz kids like Brian Setzer and Danny Gatton, you know, come up out of nowhere and, and start blending a whole bunch of things together and that affects the, the way you hear the music too. I mean, you can have the same guitar tone and have a really great early rockabilly sound um, or sorry, you could have a really modern rockabilly sound, but you just don't feel like it sounds rockabilly because you're not getting the, you know, you don't have that. You might be going. It might be in your fingers, you know. You might be a little stiff. You might have spent a lot of time playing those early records, and if you try and play modern stuff, even if you've got the tone right, you're not going to sound like a modern player. Uh, likewise, if you're, you've got uh, a really old school sound, if we take everything off, and you rip at it like Danny Gatton or Seto, I'm going to try to anyway. My point is, I actually forgot what my point was briefly, but I remembered again. Uh, you know, it, it still sounds like you kind of got like a modern rockabilly thing going on because you're throwing throwing all these ideas around that are from modern players. So there is also that element, but I guess that muddies the water a little bit. But that brings me to my summary, and it's been a really, really good fun making this video. If you have watched it all, I really appreciate it. Uh, by the way, I have a new softbox light, so the lighting should finally be about right in here, which I'm I'm hope, hoping that you're really digging. But yes, the, the summary to all this, which you've probably got a pretty good idea of from listening, is there are actually multiple rockabilly sounds, and I think it would be unfair to say that a Gretsch is the ultimate rockabilly guitar, because at the beginning they weren't really even being used for rockabilly through the mid-50s, they did become popular, but it was more the single coil models, um, and it wasn't until the late 50s that you know humbuckers were really around, sort of from 57 on. There's that big argument whether Gretsch were first or whether uh, Gibson were first. Who cares? Doesn't really bother me at all. Um, and then the whole Gretsch thing and, and the filtertrons and all that sort of stuff, that's that's part of the modern sound. But Danny Gatton's sound was amazing as well. So it's almost not even so much the guitar, but the fact that we can put these amazing effects pedals in our signal chain and uh, and create you know, almost like an exaggerated version of those mid-50s recordings, which is kind of really good fun. So that's my take on it, everyone. Let me know what you think in the comments. I hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, I've got plenty of more good stuff to come, so make sure you subscribe, like, and if you really want tabs, if you want to support the channel, uh, you can either join my website where I've got a, a library of licks and, and transcriptions, full songs in many cases, uh, or you can join the Patreon and I release the tabs um, as, the, as the videos come out. So they're all there in a feed. So they're all there for you. Um, go check it out. Thanks for watching. I will see you guys in the next video.